Hi, everybody. In this video, we're going to take a look at product rendering in Twinmotion 23. I'll give you some advice on how your models should be constructed and what I think the best workflow is for this type of work. Now, we'll also bring our finished renders into Photoshop. We'll talk about a little bit about post-production for your finished product renders. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. Okay, everyone. So the first thing that you need to be sort of thoughtful about is your actual models. Quite simply, if you want to do product rendering, it's going to start with the 3D model. Now, I am not a product renderer and I don't really build a huge amount of 3D objects anymore. So I'm going to use some objects here from iMesh. iMesh is, in my mind, probably the best collection of Blender uh, 3D objects, especially for architectural visualization. So you can see here, if we pop over to a Blender, I have downloaded and set up a very simple scene right now. We have on the bottom just a basically coffee table, wooden block style, and I've brought in the iMesh coffee maker model. Let's hit this in the viewport and see what it actually looks like. So you can see here, this is my viewport model. Looks pretty good. So the important thing to note about this when bringing in sort of objects to use in Twinmotion you really want very well-made models. iMesh is a perfect example of this. These models are fantastically well-built, but you do need to be mindful of a couple of things. Firstly, if your 3D model is software-specific, if it's a Blender file or a, uh, maybe a 3D uh, Studio Max file, for example, you can't necessarily guarantee that all of those details will transfer over. For example, if you set up your materials in 3D Studio Max, you have to be mindful that there's a good chance they will not fully transfer over to twin motion. So you're better off working with just the model without getting down into, you know, really thinking too much about the texture maps or anything like that. Think of it as just uh, sort of models, not materials. Now, the next thing to note is your model still has to be built to a very, very high standard. You can see here built into this really beautiful iMesh model is quite a lot of polygons and it's it's overall just beautifully modeled quite simply um everything here goes back to the quality of the model more so than the lights or necessarily the materials models are really important if you're going to be doing this sort of product shot all right looks pretty good if you've got any modifiers like turbo smooth let's go ahead and reset the x forms or in this case in blender go ahead and commit all of the turbo smooth once that's done, we can fire this over using FBX. As it currently stands, if you're a twin motion user and you use Blender, there isn't really a data smith for that, which is a little bit annoying. I think it is in the works, but there's not one that exists right now. So let's go ahead and just export this with FBX instead. So here we are in twin motion 23. And what we're actually going to do is open up the basic lighting product shot. I'm going to click on that. I have it downloaded already. I'm going to say no to this existing file and I'm just going to load this up. It's about 400 megabytes. So, you know, download time may vary a little bit. Definitely worth utilizing this one though. We could also use the one with the display plinth. However, we're going to use our wooden iMesh table as our display plinth for our shot. Okay. Here we are in twin motion. If I pull the camera back and I'm going to hit four on my keyboard to move a little bit faster, you can kind of see what we have now. Very nice. I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer now and I am going to select these shoes and you can see on the right on the scene tree, we've got right shoe, left shoe. I'm going to select both of those by holding down shift, right click and delete those. I do not need them. Okay, I'm going to use the import tab to bring this in and please note that when we do this, I don't have a data smith, so we're just going to have to bring in the geometry in a sort of old style. All right, everybody. So our uh, two objects have appeared. Uh, we brought them into twin motion using FBX, just regular old import. You can literally see that right there. And you'll notice that they're facing the wrong way. So what I will do is go to the top right here, the scene tree. And we don't need a lot of this stuff here. I've got this instances that's left over. Delete that. And now product shot FBX, I am going to rotate this. I like to work with my camera kind of positioned like this. And I am going to just bring these down. I want this sitting just kind of snug 
on the floor. Now, the background plane, this S curve, it's a little small, so I'm going to hit 9 on the keyboard, and I am going to scale that up. I want the background transition to be pretty smooth. Um, I am looking for a pretty smooth background here. Okay, that looks very nice. If I zoom in, yeah, looks pretty good. I think we're in a really good spot. All right, let's move on. Okay, now that we've got our object in, it's time to talk about materials. So I'm going to go to the library tab over here, and I'm not going to run through all of the materials, but the ones that you do want to be very cognizant of, I think when it comes to product shots, are going to be things like glass. So what I'm going to do here is, you can see we've got a wide variety of glass in twin motion. I'm going to drag out the clear glass onto, I want to make sure it goes on here. There we go. And this is actually going to be kind of the milk container. It's basically just going to be a frother on the coffee machine. So it's going to do like, you know, warm milk or, you know, foam milk if you're doing a cappuccino or a latte. But you'll notice the clear glass is not ideal. So what we can try is this one here, two-sided glass, and we can drag that directly out as well. And there is also item glass. Um, not really sure exactly the difference between these, but try that clear, two-sided, or item glass. Those are going to be really, really good. I may end up setting on item glass for this. It's see-through, but is also kind of reflective at the same time. It's kind of pretty nice. Now, the other thing is going to be plastic, and for that, I'm going to go to the plastic tab, and the best thing I could recommend for this, if we are kind of winging it, is going to be this glossy plastic right here. Just drag that directly onto the black areas, what will be the black areas on my coffee machine, and I think that looks really good. Roughness is nice. We can go up here now and just change the color completely, and I'm going to suggest, you know... For this, I'm going to try and make this a little bit more vivid. I'm going to make it red, I think. Okay, the next thing I did do was on our plastic material, if we zoom in here, you can see that the default twin motion plastic material didn't have any normal map. And so I did once again use a eye mesh material. You can see this is plastic polished scratched and I just downloaded the 4K and I just installed it straight into twin motion in the normal map tab. So if I scroll down here, you can see there we have. We also have the options to invert the normal and we can adjust the strength of the normal map. But really every material if you look really, really close and product shots, you are really, really close. You really do want to have normal map details on every surface. All right, moving on to the metal. You can see on the left here, I am in the just the default twin motion metal. And you've got some really, really nice stuff here just by default, which is kind of crazy. You've got some fantastic materials. And so what I'm going to look for is just a suitable... This one, brushed aluminum or aluminium, depending on your pronunciation. I'm going to drag that out onto the sides. Okay. You can see where it's working and where it's not. I kind of like it. It's a little bit too strong, and it's actually not dark enough. So let's hit T on the keyboard. I'm going to click this material, and I'm going to make sure it is set to metallic. Yeah, that's good. In terms of UVs, let's take a look at the scale on the right-hand side. I'm going to bring this down quite a bit, and I think that's good. And we may rotate it just a little bit, um, just to get it lined up maybe perfectly. So let's see, can we just offset it a little bit? And what I need, oh, not the speed, because that's going to increase the speed. Um, and let's see, can we just kind of, I wonder, can I rotate this just a little dash? There we go, and just spin now, one thing we have noticed is it's not necessarily being evenly distributed to this section here. And I think overall, it's probably, it's probably a little too shiny. So let's go and make it a little bit darker. By default, its color is, yeah, there we go. Um, by default, the color is a little bit too white. I, I do kind of want this to be a little bit darker. Click OK. And yeah, looks pretty good. Let's move on. Now, one thing to note is if you have an area of your model that you would like to, you know, be its own sort of color or material into in motion, I'm going to bounce back to Blender. And you can see, I'm just going to do this in Blender really quickly. This area here down at the bottom. So this is already selected. I'm going to hold down Control 
and hit plus on my numpad. And I would like this to be a slightly different material. I'm just going to keep pulling down control until I think this has gotten pretty much all of that part. Go to the right, go to, let me see, uh, show my uh, blender um, lack of experience here. And I'm going to go to the right here and then just click new, add new material. I'm going to assign it. And it's going to be just a new principal B BSDF, which is really just the standard um, blender material. And I'm going to pick a base color of something completely random. And I think that works. Okay. If we can see that. I think we should be able to see that. All right, well, it's good. And then I'm going to re-export this again. All right, so let's do that. All right, and you can see we've re-imported the FBX. We exported this out from Blender. And in Twinmotion, just hover on the FBX and hit the little re-import or sort of refresh icon. And that will bring it right back in. And so I'm going to change this material now, this one down here, which is recognized as its own material. And let's put this to, we kind of want something like, uh, kind of plastic, but I'm thinking more like this, maybe this rubber material. And I think that looks good. Yeah, I overall like this. I think our uh, aluminum is probably a little too dark, but you know, all in all, we're still pretty good. I'm going to pause it there and I'm going to just fix up all of the materials here that we like the look of, get everything looking as good as we think it can. And then we'll set up our render really quick. Hey, welcome back, everybody. I have gone ahead and turned off recording of the camera just to speed things up and to make the interface a little less bouncy. So here you can see we're finished with our materials. Pretty happy with the look of everything right now. And I think now is pretty much a good time to look at lighting. So if you've done any product shots in the past or you used KeyShot, for example, you should be well familiar with the idea of a HDRI or high dynamic range image environment as your light source. Now, luckily, we have a lot of these built in to Twinmotion 2023. You don't have to necessarily go grab them from a website, although you can still do that if you prefer. But let's see what we can do with just the HDRIs in Twinmotion. Go here to the library, HDRI, and we're not looking for these skies because these skies are going to give kind of um, kind of a non-natural kind of like light, they'll look too much like an outside shot. So we do want to use the studio ones right here. Okay, cool. Now, you can see we've got a lot of different options, and I'm going to go for, just find one that I like the look of, and we can see kind of what works, what doesn't work. I'm going to download this one. Now, please don't, these, most of these HRIs, these studio lighting, it, it is black and white, and so we will probably have to add in a few colors ourselves just to give it a bit more of a dynamic look. There are other ones down here that you could maybe use, but I'm going to use this guy right here. Left click, drag this into our scene. Okay, we've successfully dragged this into our scene. Let's pull the camera back a little bit so we can take a look and see what's going on. There we go. There is our HDRI. And I think now let's take a look at the overall ambience and lighting of our shot. So we have the HDRI that we like. Let me go to the right, go to the ambience, and I am going to turn on the path tracer because that's really going to give us the best result. So we're not going to use the real-time render. We are going to use the path tracer. Now, turn that on, give it a moment to think. And I am going to drop the quality down to low. Now, my low, I think, is a little bit different to everyone else's. I'm using very low settings just to speed things up. You can also do Control-P on the keyboard. Go to Quality, and you can see my path tracer is set to about 70%. So I believe uh, Twinmotion is basically rendering it and then upscaling it to hit the viewport. It is a lot more jaggedy, but overall, it'll give you an okay-ish, albeit faster, depiction of what your render is going to look like. All right, pretty happy with that. I'm going to go and we will add, I think, a few more lights because overall, the, the image lighting is nice, but it's, uh, I think it needs, it needs color and needs a little bit more variation. So let's do that next. So before we get to add some lights, I am going to adjust the rotation of our HDRI, our Studio 19 lighting. I'm going to just left-click on the rotation tab here and just spin it. And you're looking for something that gives some really dramatic highlights. 
yeah, I kind of like the look of, and what I'm looking at is this area right here. One of our camera shots is probably going to be kind of like this. And so we kind of want something that really kind of gets some really lovely highlights on the metal. Yeah, I think that looks pretty nice. Okay, that's good. And what we should do now is go to media. And you can see I've got a whole bunch of images. So these ones here are actually from the default. If you remember what we loaded up was the default product shot for the shoes. So I'm going to just delete these and this will be pretty quick. Just delete them. And then we are going to add our own instead. Place our camera here where we intentionally want to show off the coffee machine. And it doesn't have to be perfect right now. Just get it good enough. Yeah, I like the look of that quite a bit. And we might tilt the camera so it's a little bit more on. And let's look at that. I want to make sure we're getting that some of the wood in the shot just because I think it looks really, really nice. And there we go. All right, that's going to be shot one. Go back to my library here and go to lights. Okay, so my suggestions for this, we want to avoid using these omnidirectional or spotlights or even the neon lights. Um, they are going to cast some pretty interesting shadows that we don't want, and they're going to cast sort of directional shadows. So I'm going to click on area light. And I'm going to place one back behind on this guy. I'll just place this. And I'm going to scale this fella down. Okay, I'm going to scale this light, but first I do want to rotate it so I can actually see what it's doing. And so let me just lift up the camera, rotate this, and I'm looking to see where the light is actually going. So I am going to change the color, and I'm going to change it to something quite vivid here. Let's do this, um, let's do green, just because it will allow us to see where the light is going. That looks nice. And I also I'm going to turn down the ambience. So we are currently using our HDRI environment and it's set to about seven. I'm gonna drop this way down. There we go. Now I can see kind of what I'm working with. And this is going to act as our effectively our backlight or rim light. Now we are gonna change the color, obviously. We're not gonna go for something that's you know this pronouncedly green and certainly something that is kind of casting a kind of light up onto the back plate. But we do want it. There we go. I think that looks nice. It is working the way we want it to work. We can go back to the media mode and just click on our stored cameras here. We will have to, again, once you do that, you do have to go to the, back to the HRI environment and change the uh, intensity again, because that is dependent on the stored images. Okay, so this is going to be light number one. I shall move this a little bit to the left. Considering that our camera angle is going to be kind of like this for the first shot, what I want from this is just a effectively a rim light. So this will be on kind of on the back of our object. Okay, let's position this a little bit more. And now that I think we have it in a pretty good spot, let me quit the media mode. Let's select it. And the color itself, I'm going to go for something. Since we've got red, let's go for kind of a blue, possibly rim light here. And... I want this kind of, you know, just behind the scene. I don't necessarily want it everywhere. And sorry about the spinny camera right there. Okay, looks good. Let's look at the attenuation. Attenuation is going to be the fall off. And I want to get this, if I can, just to where it's coming, just a little bit past our object. Okay, I think that looks nice. Let's see how this looks with our, back in our original setting. So go to the HRI, type in seven. All right, and you can see the effect that it's having right there on the shot. Now it's probably a little too strong, a little too pronounced, but it is, it's not bad. I think it could work quite well. So I'm gonna tweak this, and then I'm going to add one or two more of these area lights. And if we click on the area light themselves, again, getting out of medium mode, let's put our, go back to, Thanks uh, to Emotion for auto-saving. Uh, and go back to the intensity of 7 or something akin to that. And right-click and get off that. This will give you a good idea of how the light is actually working. And so we can move this around and we can rotate it and tweak it to our heart's content. The thing that's going to matter the most is really just the intensity 
the length and width and the attenuation, but I'm pretty happy with the attenuation. The intensity, we could dial it up or dial it back down, but I just want it to be just a little bit there, just a little bit dramatic. So I might put this around 150 perhaps, and there we go. Okay, there we go. We're getting a lovely little highlight just right there, and you could tweak this to your heart's content. So I've gone ahead and added three more lights. Let me quit the media mode, and we can see what's actually happening. All right, light one, that was the original blue sort of rim light. The second area light over here is just a little bit hard to see, but what it's adding is adding a little dash of this pink color, which is really hitting the chrome. And then lastly, I have another area light outside. And so that's coming in from the right. And you can see uh, if we just spin the camera ever so slightly, you can kind of see the effect that we've got going on. So there is the front of our coffee machine. And so we've got a blue light on the back, a kind of pinkish one coming in from the left. And again, we're using all these area lights. And then on the right, I've got a teal one. Now, the important thing here, I think, to mess with is really the intensity. Crank it really high and then drop it really low. Same for the attenuation. Start with it really far and manually just bring this slider back by typing in different values here. All right. I think that's a pretty good lighting setup. And then if we go back to our, let's go back to our rendered mode. And I'm going to hit the path tracing on. And you can see we're getting the teal highlight here. We're getting a little bit of the pink here. Probably need to crank that up a little bit more. And you're getting slight kind of blue light around the edges here. It might be a little hard to see, but I think all in all, that's pretty good. Now, the next thing that we can tweak if we want to get into this is just looking at the intensity. So by default, I think the sort of HRIs come in at about an intensity of four, I think. And so we do want to just keep tweaking this. We want to get something where the image is bright, but not necessarily completely blown out where the lights we've added have become sort of muted or not even visible. So we're going to just mess with this and find maybe a value that works. And everyone's shot is going to be a little bit different, I think. Moving on to the camera, uh, I'm still working on just primarily this image, the image straight on from the shot. So let's take a look at sort of the camera settings that we can do for this. Okay, focal length, definitely going to want to tweak this, I believe. And um, I'm going to go pretty high. I'm going to take this up to about 40. And I think for a straight on shot, I'm pretty happy with that. Hit the refresh or update on the shot. And then I'm going to hit or to open up a path tracer and just take a look at this. I think I'm going to position the camera slightly to the right, just a little bit on this to kind of try and get a little bit on. It's straight on, but I want to show ever so slightly, if I can, a slight edge on the object. Yeah, there we go. And we got that nice highlight coming in. All right, I'm pretty, yeah, pretty happy with that. It's not a perfect sort of uh, orthographic shot, but I do think it still looks pretty good. All right, depth of field, we're going to do this in Photoshop. Camera effects, parallelism, yes, we absolutely want that on vignetting. Um, yeah, let's let's do that. Let's let's kind of crank that just a little bit here. Let's see how that looks. I don't want to do it so strong that it, it kind of darkens the entire center of the image. So I think that's really too pronounced. So let's put it back to 20 and see where we're at. Yeah, that'll work for me. We don't need near clipping really. And the compositional overlays, uh, we can put this onto grid if you want. Uh, and just try and line it up. But considering I do want to get basically a little bit of really just the sides. So I think I, yeah, no, you know, you can kind of use the grid to line it up, but I'm pretty happy overall where things are. I think there's definitely some, I do need to position the camera a little bit more based on this grid. And there we go. Kind of centrally align everything as much as possible. Hit refresh. And then I am, again, going to slightly tilt the camera ever so slightly. Even though it's kind of nicely lined up, I do still want to get a little bit of that edge. And I've put the camera speed down really low, down to like, you know, almost non-existent, just below one. And there we go. Again, put that little grid back on and just see if there's any way we can get a nice compromise here between the straight on shot and being slightly on the right. Okay, that works for me, I think. 
All right. Other than that, I'm pretty happy. We can also do things like add effects, uh, contrast, saturation, but I think we're going to do all of this in Photoshop. Now, I've set up one image. I'm going to click uh, to add another one. And this one is going to be on a much more pronounced angle. And I think that looks really, really nice. Getting the best of sort of everything into that shot. All right. Looks good. Okay, let's go ahead and render these out. And we're going to try doing something a little bit different. We're going to try and render out some render passes. So let me try to set up one more shot just straight on here. And we'll hopefully this will give you an idea of what we're going to do. There we go. So now we've got image 9, 11, and 12, all slightly different angles. But all in all, I think will look really nice when we're actually rendered. All right. right, let's. I'm going to do image 12, which is the straight on shot first. I'm going to render that out. Go to image settings, output size. We are going to put it to 4K. Like realistically, you'd probably want to do this at 8 or 16 if you can. But for our purposes, 4K should work fine. Go to export. I'm going to turn off the media mode here. You can kind of see that uh, the path tracer settings. If I go back to ambience here and I do click on render, I I'm going to put this to high. You know, let's put the samples up to about 250. Okay. And put the anti-aliasing down to about one, which is the lowest. Anti-aliasing will smooth the image, and I don't want that. I want it to be as sharp as possible. Now we can go to export, and we can click on image. And I am going to do image 12, which is the one that was straight on. And I'm going to turn off the real time. We do not need that. We want the path tracer. And now I'm going to render that out. Just a couple of things. Our renders are now done. And I just wanted to point out a couple of little things that I think you might want to know about as well. So the first is that the area lights, I turn on shadows for all three area lights. I do think that's kind of recommended. Uh, otherwise, it just kind of throws things a little bit. I'm going to turn off the path tracer here. So just make sure those shadows are on. I did also drop in under the library tools a reflection probe. I just used the regular box reflection probe, and I really just sort of dropped it right into the scene. Okay. And again, we did 4K, so we have all three of them rendered out now. And the render settings, the path tracing settings, I did increase that all the way up to about, I think, 500 bounces or samples per pixels and 10 bounces. And I think that gives you a overall pretty good result. Let me quit the media mode. Now, one thing to note, we do not have the ability right now in Twin Motion to render out render passes, which is something that Keyshot can do. And so what I'm going to do is try and replicate that. So go back to media. I'm going to click on image 12 because that's the one that I kind of really like. Go to my library. And the first thing I'm going to do is go to my materials. I'm going to find a, effectively, if I can get a metal that's black, but really, really shiny. I did find these car materials, uh, which is going to be under car paint. And this car paint black, the specular one, works perfectly. You can simply drag it out onto pretty much every surface, and this will give you all of those nice specular highlights. We're also going to, at some point, render out a just a completely matte one with basically changing this background, so we'll be able to make a selection. Now, I am going to do that for pretty much every one of these shots, and I am going to just go back to the path tracer. We don't need the samples to be as high for this, so I can put that back to about 150. Make sure we're doing that on all of these now. These are going to sit on our layers in Photoshop and just give us a little bit more control over really the overall look. So this is going to be our specular highlight layer, which I think looks all in all pretty good. Everything else is set to the same. Now, I am, when we go to image, I'm going to drop this down to just 2K and then we can upsize each of these manually in Photoshop. We don't need them to be full, kind of full 4K. But, uh, you know, I think they'll look all in all pretty good. Even with just 2K, we'll resize them in Photoshop and let Photoshop figure out how to do it. This will render things out a little bit faster. All right, let's render these out. The next render that we're going to export is a pretty basic one. And if we go to FX under Clay Render, we can toggle this on and off. And you can see the Clay Render is exactly just that. Really, really nice shot. And we can apply the same effect 
to really the entire scene. So I'm going to change the color on each of these to white. And I'm pretty happy. You do on each shot, though, have to turn off the area lights. So let's turn these guys off on each one. And I'm going to refresh each one once I have the camera lined up. And again, make sure all of these lights are off. And turn off the path tracer just while we work. This will give us a better idea of how things are working. So turn off area lights, one, two, and three. And click in our camera again. Make sure they're off, one, two, three. And hit refresh. I'm going to do this on all of these shots here. Again, as long as you don't change really the uh, camera position, all of this stuff will work pretty nicely. Change the color. And again, turn off the path tracer, change the color, put that back to white. And you're going for something sort of medium contrast here. This is going to give us all the nice nooks and crannies, and basically give us the fake shadows. All right, click on image line again. I have a bad habit of not doing that. And then hit refresh. Okay, so we've got one, two. And again, we can adjust the clay render. Can I try and you're going to get uh, something along those lines. That will work nicely. Something that gives you a nice little bit of contrast. That's all we're going for. And I'll bring this fella back up just a dash. I think that looks good. And then we'll go ahead and render these back out. You do also have the ability to show off details and you can adjust the reflection and things like that. We just want shadows in this. So really we can take down the reflection. We don't really want anything else. You can turn on the bump as well. And hopefully that will give you finer details. Not tried it with that yet, but it's pretty cool that we can do that. Now, go back to export. And we're going to export these three out again. All right, everybody, we are in Photoshop with our render passes done. You can see here, we've got the material ID, sometimes referred to as the clown pass. We have the AO, which I tweaked to make it a little bit more contrasty. And we have our specular or highlight layers. All right, let's, uh, I'm going to run through this really quickly. You'll also notice I did change the background to black. Uh, it's probably a little too dark. It should be kind of a little bit more gray, I think, than this. But by leaving it white, I did run into an issue here where the porcelain of the cup and some of this area over here kind of all blended together. And... You know, I took a pause there to look at some work in the Keyshot Gallery, and oftentimes you are putting things on a darker background to make them pop. So that's what we'll work off the basis of. All right, right-click, duplicate our background layer, click OK. And we can move the Clown Pass layer uh, very much down to the bottom. We shouldn't really need this. AO layer, I'm going to duplicate this. And I'm going to turn off visibility on the top one. So the first one, I am going to change this to... We're probably going to do a mixture of kind of things here. Overlay and multiply will be kind of the direction we go. Let's do multiply first and drop this quite low. Kind of want... There we go. And the second one, put this at about... Probably about 50%. And this one is going to go to overlay. And you can kind of see when we have these together... You get the just kind of the darker areas just get a little more pop. And I think that looks good. Overlay. And we can actually, I'm going to try, let's put this guy up to, we could try, let me see here. See how vivid light works. Actually, yeah, that'll work quite nicely. There we go. Lovely stuff. Okay, move on to the specular highlight layer. Again, drop this down to about 50 and we are going to go look initially at lighten and screen. And I'm just looking at the, just really, you're just looking at effectively kind of the specular highlights. So let's do screen and only looking at the center area here. Yeah, we are losing a little bit of the glass reflections. Let's take a look and see what's causing that. So I think it's this one here. So I'm going to mask these out to give myself more control. So I've added a mask and I'm going to paint out the effects on each layer. And then I'm going to actually paint it back in. Okay, not really sure what's causing the sound effects there. All right, let's drop this. So... Okay, 
let's just start brushing this back in just on the areas where we do want it. So I'm going to take down the cup a little bit and I'm going to make sure it's not blowing out these areas too much. And I'll bring back the contrast. There we go. That looks nice. But we're keeping it on all the areas where we want it to be. Again, using black, paint out your mask. You can also paint out the entirety of the mask and then use white to just effectively paint it or brush it back in. And I like kind of like that approach. That's the one that I learned with ZBrush uh, render passes. You sort of paint everything out and then paint what you need back in. Okay, specular highlight layer. You can see, obviously, we've kind of lost a lot here on this one. Add your mask. And again, just paint on the relevant areas. So that's that lighten at 50%. Let's duplicate this one one more and just run through and see if there's any other blend modes that we want to use. So click on normal. And honestly, this one right here, the linear dodge add, gets back a lot of the cup. So there we go. I think all in all, that looks pretty nice. Select all of these. I am going to group them. It's kind of the fast way to do this. Let's put them in a little group and then right click and duplicate said group. And we can again, right click and merge that down. So just taking a look, there's the original and there's the one with all the adjustments done. Not too bad. Okay, I'm gonna duplicate this one more time. Now, there is a lot probably that you could do. And, you know, for this post-production for product shots is really not really my speciality at all. And um, so I'm just going to wing this slightly. Let's go up to filter and we are going to go to camera raw filter. And this one, I'm really just going to wing it. We're just going to see what we can do and check the exposure. I don't want to blow out the whites too much. So let's look at those and do we need to bring those back a little. I think we do need to bring them down. And with the blacks, I think we could probably lighten that just a dash. Okay, the highlights we're definitely wanting to keep those in there because really the highlights are going to sell in many ways. I think that really kind of like sharp product look. There we go. All right. We're going to zoom in. We're going to look at the detail here. I am going to add a little bit of texture. Also, you're going to really add quite a lot of clarity here. So if we zoom back out, you can kind of see the effect of this. And clarity is really going to help make it pop quite a bit. All right, that looks good. And you're getting some gorgeous specular highlights on the right. We're not really going to mess with the dehaze slider because really there's no reason that we'd be adding like a huge amount of this haze effect. So we can move it a little bit to the right. And I think that'll work. Okay, vibrance, take that up. And saturation, I might pull that back just a little bit. It looks a little unnaturally red. Uh, clicking on the curves, we do have some really dark areas. You can kind of see that right here um, that are maybe like maybe too dark. So we can lift those up just a little bit. And let's see, can we just grab... Just tweaking things here. And I don't think I'll be able to, you can do that from up here on the top left. And I'm just going to bring where the darks have gone really black. Let's bring that back just a little bit. Okay. Detail sharpening. We'll do all that a little bit later. Uh, color mixture really for the reds, but uh, the red has gotten very, uh, probably pronouncedly too strong. So we may bring that back just a dash. And keep the luminance quite high. I'm pretty happy with everything else right now. Color grading optics, we're not going to use. Geometry, we're not going to use. Uh, grain, we probably will add a little bit of that later on. You know, I think I'm pretty happy with it. Let's go ahead and click OK. All right, you can see the difference there. And now if it's too strong or too pronounced, we can always just drop this down a little bit. Again, select both of these guys, right click, duplicate, click OK, and merge them. Uh, duplicate one more time. And what we're missing is depth of field. So we're going to go filter, blur, and I'm going to do Gaussian blur on this one. And we're going to make it quite pronounced. 10 is fine. 
And then what we can do, go to the very bottom, use the magic wand, select the background, make sure we're trying to get as much of it as we can. So that selection is a little bit iffy. Let's make it a bit stronger, maybe 16. And again, there, that's, I can live with that. All right, go all the way back up here. And you can see we have everything selected. If we add a mask right now, you can see now it'll keep, you can kind of see the effect it's having. The mask is blocking the blur on this layer. So we're seeing this layer underneath. And because of that, if we toggle it on and off, and we zoom in here, you can kind of see the effect that it's having. A little bit of a blur, but also a little bit of a glow effect. Uh, yeah, I don't uh, don't necessarily dislike it. There's probably a few more things you could do to tweak that, but I'm kind of running out of time, so let's go ahead and wrap it up. Um, quite happy with that. Drop it a little bit, little dash. Select both of these, right-click, duplicate. Okay, and merge them one more time. These are all the old ones now. Put them in a group. And we're going to right-click and duplicate this guy one more time. Now, you could probably do kind of like crazy lens flare and stuff like that. Um, really not entirely sure. You could also go in with the burn dodge tools if you really wanted to kind of tweak this a little bit. But I'm thinking I'm going to go and wrap this up for now. Let's go filter. Other. We'll do a little high pass. And I'm going to put this to about one, I reckon. And then change that blend mode to, let's put that to overlay. And again, if we zoom in here, you're getting all that high-end fidelity, all that sharp little detail coming back in. Yeah, it's a really great cheap technique to get detail back into your shot. All right, I'm going to just merge that down. Yeah. All right, everyone. As a finishing touch, I just went ahead and wrote the Via Render logo here in text and just added a gradient fill on top of it. And um, I think we're going to go and leave it there for today. If you made it to the end of this video, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really hope that it gave you some idea about how to set up doing product shots within Twin Motion and then bouncing over to Photoshop. Uh, thanks again so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.